Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Sheridan, and I'm in the psychology department. And today I have the honor of introducing Nicholas, our first presenter this afternoon, so you can see. And Nicholas is an outstanding student. He acts as a leader and a mentor to his peers. This past weekend, Nicholas was awarded the Distinguished Psychology Student Award. This award added to Nicholas's list of accomplishments, including his membership in the Honors Program, his induction into the Psychi Psychology Honor Society, the Leroy Lee Smith Memorial Award in 2019-2020, and a Junior Marshall Selection for the graduating class of 2021. I share these accomplishments with you to exemplify the amazing student that Nicholas truly is. For the past four years, I've been Nicholas's professor and academic advisor, providing me with the opportunity to observe his growth and successes. Nicholas's thesis provided me with an additional opportunity to meet with him individually for the past one to two years, getting to know him more than just a student in my class. I already knew he was intelligent, committed, hardworking, and exhibited academic excellence. But through this experience, I learned he is also a talented musician. He's hardworking in his job. He's a dependable friend to his peers and his family. And all of this evidences his character, not only as an exceptional student, but also as a person. When Nicholas first started his thesis, we were entering into the pandemic, which alone provided complexities that required navigation, as we all know and remember. Um, I initially got a Nicholas to look at a population that would be, he'd be able to access since we already had some roadblocks ahead. Um, and then brainstormed and how that could be tied into psychology to provide the benefits to his learning. After some discussion and research, Nicholas landed on the topic of the psychological impact of sensory neural hearing loss and the potential benefit of hearing aids on social interactive interaction and perceived quality of life. Nicholas always came to meetings prepared. He always had an agenda. He took notes during our meetings and he implemented the feedback almost immediately. Not only am I proud of Nicholas's thesis and academic work, but I am excited for all of his future accomplishments as he pursues his master's degree at UNCG in counseling with a concentration in clinical, men clinical mental health post his graduation from GC. I now invite Nicholas to come forward to share his work with you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick, and I'm going to be presenting on the psychosocial effects of hearing loss and the potential benefit of hearing aids. It's a long title, but I'll try to explain as best as I can. Um, so the main questions I'm trying to answer today is what is sensory neural hearing loss? Um, what are the psychological and social impairments that those people face uh, that suffer from hearing loss? And how do hearing aids kind of fit in? Um, so sensory neural hearing loss is a type of hearing loss that affects the cilia and the inner ear, uh, as opposed to conductive, which is like, um, say, if the bones inside your ear were to collapse, uh, something like that. So uh, the sensory neural hearing loss can be from uh, noise exposure, uh, as well as uh, certain types of autoimmune diseases as well. Um, I chose this because um, it's more common, so it was easier to kind of get a sample group together um, for that. Uh, so what are the psychosocial effects of sensory neural hearing? Uh, I read a bunch of articles and there were three main ones that kind of kept appearing. And that was psychological distress, um, social impairments, um, and then uh, the last one is um, satisfaction, like low satisfaction with life. Um, so a little bit of background before I go into the research heavy stuff. Um, so hearing loss was first defined as the hear, uh, the ear that hears badly. Uh, in Egypt, that was the first recorded uh, time that we have there. Um, and it was con uh, treated with a concoction of goat urine and insect larvae. Um, in ancient times, it was heavily stigmatized. Um, specifically in Roman times, uh, they were regarded as subhuman. Uh, they were barred from any type of religious participation. Um, so we kind of come a long way. We have many different oral rehabilitation programs. Um, and lots of studies regarding it. But with this specific field, I noticed that it was mainly in European and Asian <coughs> countries. Uh, most of the research that we've conducted in the US uh, is government funded and specifically deals with those that have Medicare. 
So uh, I uh, chose to do my research at a local uh, audiology clinic called High Point Audiological. Uh, they have quite a diverse range of uh, patients that have different types of insurance, different uh, social and economic uh, situations. So let's see. So why does this all matter? Um, I believe that hearing loss presents as a um, public health crisis. And I say that because of these two graphs. So if you see there on the one on the left there, there is a five times higher likelihood of developing dementia uh, if someone is experiencing hearing loss. Um, there are also increased prevalence of depression and anxiety in those that suffer from hearing loss. Um, and that number has stayed about the same. It's at 14%. Uh, and that's just ages 20 to 69. As we get to that higher range, it's uh, almost uh, 60 to 70 percent, um, but it's not falling. And so I think that it, it's something that we should definitely look at a bit further. Um, so about 15 to 26 percent of the world's population is affected, 14 percent of the U.S. Uh, but that number is expected to jump from 73 or from 44.1 million to 73.5 million, almost doubling by the year 2060. Um, and alongside of that, the prevalence of dementia is expected to double every 20 years. So they're kind of um, comorbid there. Um, so what was my study specifically? Um, I uh, arranged a survey of the high point audiological patients. I took a uh, random selected sample of 100 from their total population. Um, and I split that into two groups. Um, and I came across uh, kind of one of the first hurdles there where it was pretty hard to find uh, those that had never had any experience with hearing aids. So it split between uh, those that had worn hearing aids for over a month and those that had worn them from none to less than a month. Um, subjects were then tested um, with a series of parameters to assess for the psychological distress, uh, social impairment, and quality of life. Um, specifically for um, psychological distress, I used the Kessler scale. Um, for social functioning, the social functioning questionnaire, and the hearing handicap inventory for adults. And I'll speak more on that later. Um, and then for quality of life, I used the satisfaction of life scale. Um, I was hoping then to kind of compare my research to that um, research that I had uh, gleaned from European and Asian countries to see kind of how the U.S. Uh, was faring as well. Uh, So what information did my study produce? Um, I figured out pretty quickly that <laughs> distributing a survey is, is pretty <laughs> difficult in a medical setting. Uh, many of the patients that I gave it to uh, were either angry with me or threw it back <laughs> in my face. Um, and so uh, unfortunately, I was only get, able to get about 38 uh, surveys from that 100 sample, and it split 23 aided and 15 non aided um, there was also, at the time, it was kind of a unique uh, experience because we were kind of right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So there was a lot of societal and political mistrust. Um, although I tried to um, explain that I was attached to the college, a lot of people thought, you know, this had to do something with the vaccine or some type of political agenda, and I, I could not convince them otherwise. Um, so, you know, I think given the chance to do it again, I might get a little bit stronger. Uh, but um, so uh, it also limited in a unique way that most of our patients were socially uh, isolated, uh, either through quarantine or extended stays at the hospital. Um, so those were kind of a confounding variable in my research. Um, I also noticed uh, through the research that those that had worn the hearing aids um, often were a bit older in age range. And so that comes into play uh, in my results section. But um, of the 38 surveys that I recorded, um, psychological distress was much lower in those that had worn the hearing aids. Um, social scores were also, and, and that's positive, but psychological stress was lower. <laughs> um, social scores were lower in uh, the non aided category, which was negative. They were less social. And then the life, uh, life satisfaction scores were higher with the aided group. Uh, and I think that kind of tied to the older age. A lot of these people, um, at my age range was about 50 to 75. Um, so those in that higher age uh, had kind of completed what they wanted to in life, while those that were in the non aided closer to the lower. Uh, 50s uh, still had a lot to do. So that that um, kind of is where I think most of that uh, 
disparity came from. So here are um, a, just a graphical depiction of what I just mentioned. Uh, if you look at that Kessler scale, you can kind of see up at the top that that average um, for the non-aided and orange uh, is, is quite a bit higher, especially the outliers uh, in that data set. Um, the most severe difference was the hearing handicap inventory, where you can see um, the orange is much outweighs the, the blue. So without you know going into the graphs a bit more, I, I kind of explained, but um, so what 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 did that mean? What what did all those graphs mean? Um, well, I took all that raw data and I put it into two sample t test. And while the raw data shows quite a bit of big difference between the two groups, it was not statistically uh, significant. So um, I was not able to um, kind of um, prove my hypothesis. Uh, I was not able to reject the null in that uh, situation. Um, but it did let me know that, hey, maybe we can be doing a little bit more. Maybe hearing aids aren't the end all be all solution for hearing loss. Maybe we need more of an integrated model where we connect those that are experiencing hearing loss with maybe the hearing aids to help, uh, but then also a neurology or therapy uh, approach as well. Um, I am excited to say, though, that this research has made quite a significant impact on high point audiological. They will be partnering um, with a group called Cogniview, and what that is, is it's a um, early cognitive screener uh, for dementia and Alzheimer's. So not only will patients be receiving hearing care, they will also be connected to different specialists in the field um, and kind of that initial step forward. I think a lot of our patients are kind of skeptical of the whole medical process, but if they're comfortable with our doctors uh, and then they can kind of you know, make that step uh, to, uh, that can be really beneficial. So I'm, I'm excited that that's um, something that, that came up the research. Um, so it's pretty short and sweet. Um, there, uh, that's my long list of resources, but I thank everyone for coming today and uh, listening. And hopefully, uh, you know, you can tell your friends, anyone that you know, I'm sure somebody has hearing loss uh, and you can connect them to those resources. So thank you. Well, Nick, you're not done. Oh, I'm not done? Oh, okay. Oh, if anyone has a question. Right, right. <laughs> right. No, you don't get to ask questions. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Did anyone uh, have any questions? <laughs> yes, in the back. So, I'm Nick. I'm Eric Lively. I'm a teacher in the music department. Um, on one of your slides, you shared that over the course of the next 40 years, it looked like almost uh, a double yeah. uh, issues with hearing loss. Now, is that because hearing loss is actually becoming a bit more of a problem, or is that tied to the population? Right. The population growth? Yes, uh, exactly. So it, it it is directly impacted by population growth. It's but the the what I was kind of alluding to is it's not going down. So it's staying about the same, but our population is expanding. So there's uh, you know kind of that flood to audiological. Um, resources and there's not quite enough doctors, I believe, right now. So when that number, you know, staying the same, our population is expanding, you know, it's going to come to a big problem. Yes, I love it. I love the project. Um, I wish the pandemic hadn't <laughs> impacted your ability to get some data. I love that you have um, an outcome that's really going to impact patients. Um, I listened to this and it made me think of. The teenager sitting beside me, and I can hear their music through their earbuds, right? Um, so with the increased popularity of earbuds, right? I'm like a little bit older than you. Um, <laughs> people didn't wear right. um, earbuds back then, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe we had earphones, but they were like these foamy things that didn't right. fit great, right? So now you either have like the beats that are like suction in your ears right. or the earbuds. Um, talk to me about how you think that's going to impact. Like, do you think this projected number is low? Well, I I, I do uh, because that projected number only takes account twenty uh, to a, I think it was somewhere in the sixties. Um, so it's not accounting for the teenagers and it's not accounting um, for the elderly population. So um, with with earphones specifically, we have noticed you know we have a lot younger. Uh, kids that are coming out. That was part of it. Our newer patients are much younger than I wanted to survey. Um, so 
there are steps that manufacturers have taken where like your phone should beep at you if it's over a certain uh, threshold, but it's definitely something to look for uh, um, as you know, as everyone, most everyone is going to use uh, that kind of device. So you hypothesize for your three categories in younger populations getting this ear loss, ear loss early. Yes. How do you see that? What's actually interesting, I did look, it's a little out of the scope, but I did look at a couple um, studies that looked at that younger age range, and it's actually interesting how the neuroplasticity, uh, they kind of adapt to it a little bit more than if you had lost your hearing later in life. So there's more, you know, resources, to, you know, to learn sign language, to a different medium to kind of carry you through the rest of your life. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's, a, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe counterintuitive to what you would think. Right, exactly. Yes. yes. I like it. Thank you. No problem. All right. Any more questions? Uh, I think uh, when you go to UNCG, you can take the same experience, uh, but place a different lens on it about uh, vaccine skepticism or something. Right. <laughs> what happens when you do something, but everybody else thinks you're after something. Exactly. Um, yeah. This could be like, yeah, uh, um, but I but I uh, I appreciate it that you ended up with. Um, I'm not actually asking a question, but I appreciate that you <laughs> ended up with this uh, combo of of a uh, hearing aid and therapy. Uh, as someone I I I know I know small people uh, <laughs> can't hear very well, and and uh, hearing aids are are a big difference for them. Right, but they. You know, you, you're in a group and they can't right. hear anything because it's all just noise and hearing aids are getting better. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I watch my in-laws uh, every time we're in a group. Uh, um, I watch them shut down. They, yeah. they just can't participate in the conversation. Uh, and I have a I have a, uh, a story from long this is already long ago. But my wife's grandfather uh, had a pretty profound uh, hearing loss as well. Um, and I remember the first time I met him, um, I thought, oh, nice old man, kind of quiet. He doesn't, you know, uh, um, then everyone left and it was just he and I together. We had this amazing conversation, right? I mean, it, it was uh, very bright, very engaged, very, you know, very interested in everything that was going on. And I thought, wow, what a revelation. But it was, it was all because of hearing loss. He just, he just couldn't participate in the group. Uh, the group thing. So, you know, finding other ways for people to move forward uh, uh, just beyond the hearing yeah. aids would be uh, excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the caveats of the hearing aids is kind of amplifying the background noise as well as yeah. the human speech. Yeah. Um, so, I that was referenced in some of the studies yeah. where, um, you know, the social functioning it wasn't too different from the two groups. So, it, it was interesting, kind of that that pathway. Where and going into it, I thought, you know, okay, I know the hearing aids are going to make a big difference, uh, and they didn't. So I had to kind of, you know, back up and on and, and kind of yeah. take a that therapeutic approach. Which was yeah, sort of great. Uh, two things. The boring thing first. Uh, do you think maybe the the loss of hearing is going up because it's being diagnosed more? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big like we've always had it and right. It's actually now, yeah. it's gone down since the nineties. Oh, uh, so there was a big spike in the eighties to nineties. Maybe that had something to do with the rock of the eighties and live music. Uh, but yes, it's gone down since then. But then it stayed it stayed relatively stable since the nineties. So okay. it, I think that it, it does make a difference. But yeah, we do. I was curious about that, and then just my final congratulations to you in general, but more specifically, I have known you for a while, and I've seen you work on this for a while. Two things stand out. You never complained, ever. And according to this, you had quite a few roadblocks during COVID yes. that I was never aware of. I didn't need to be made aware. What I'm saying is most students need yeah. to be aware um, <laughs> that something's not going well. And I welcome that. That's not the problem. But you never did. So just congratulations for the way you handled it. But you're one of, as far as I can calculate very quickly, less than 20, maybe less than 15 honor students who did complete a thesis during COVID and did it well. Congratulations. Thank you. Any more questions?
so earbuds and boom boxes have come up in the questions. And it, it made me curious if there's any kind of research out there about how different methods of listening to music affect the hearing differently. Is it maybe safer to listen to loud music in the car than it is for earbuds? Is there anything I can look Yes, at yes. Anything that is placed directly on the ear is going to, it's because if you think about it, like if there was loud noise, say 115 decibels is typically when we start to experience hearing loss. If that was put 50 feet from you, uh, like if you were standing in front of a speaker, that's not going to have as much of an impact as if it's right there up in your ear. Um, so yes, there's, there's definitely something to be said. Yes. So I have listening to this about the earbuds because I use earbuds just about every day. <laughs> and um, so now I'm a little concerned. <laughs> <laughs> because especially, um, well, usually they're at the full volume and not just to drop below because either the environment that I'm in, I'm, I'm walking in their cars or I'm in the gym, there's background music and people talking and stuff. And you know, it's it's not it's at a normal level for me, but it's not like outrageously loud. But now I'm kind of a little concerned um, because I really can't hear it at a lower level. So you know, and you mentioned something that that these devices maybe the manufacturers are working on that, and like even if it prompted me and said that. You're way over yeah. the level. I feel like I'm sorry. I can't hear <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So, like, how much of a concern <laughs> should we be for those of us using earbuds on a regular basis? I mean, it's it's. I, I don't yeah, want to get into like a, a scary rate, but I, I know that about <laughs> seventy five percent of you know, like you're looking at that bar. That's typically where. Uh, the comfort setting and it, it, you know it's a suggestion from the manufacturer it's I, I kind of wish it was more something where you kind of just turn it down and be like hey you know maybe maybe go get that looked at or you know go go get uh, you know uh, uh, assistance with that but uh, it depends on the type of hearing uh, the you know hearing device um, so I wouldn't say that oh I can't hear my specific so that's a problem especially if you've got like what's this I can make a difference so if, but are, are these new, have you seen these bone conducting, uh, I mean, I guess they're earbuds, but they seem to work differently. Is is that, is that maybe an advance? Yeah, so like, a, okay, so the bone conduction, that's the other type of hearing loss. So there's the sensory neural and then the conductive. Yeah. Uh, and so then that's something that kind of, uh, I'm not too familiar on it, but I know it's, it's instead of the cilia in your ear, it's like almost like they build you another ear. Uh, so that it, it's very helpful for the patients that receive it, but it's a very difficult struggle to actually get that procedure done. Um, um, so, but it is helpful. Yes. This is more of just a comment rather than a question, but I wanted to mention of how like adaptable Nick was during this. So we were kind of brainstorming and talking about like what is the best way to survey, you know, the participants. And at first, I was like, well, probably not on mine because most of your population may be older and doing an online type of survey or they might not be comfortable with the technology. And I was like, oh, I was like, well, you could read it to them. And they just kind of looked at me, you know, oh, wait, <laughs> Harry Moss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's just really great and adaptable and finding like the best measure to gather the information. So I just wanted to make that you know, that comment. So he's just kind of old with a roadblock. He just really did a great job. Ironically, I do want to add, I did have one patient that was blind, so I did end up actually reading it to them. It was a very difficult process, but we got it done. So that's in, that's in the data there. So it did happen in predictable future. <laughs> I knew at some point, at least one. <laughs> yes. So I'm not sure if this is something that you would have come over um, in your research, um, but if you have, do you notice um, a significant decrease in hearing loss in patients that used any hearing protection? Yes. Um, so while I also work in mobile testing of, of hearing loss, um, so, you know, we, we on behalf of OSHA, you know, we test the hearing of different industries, uh, and those that wear the hear hearing uh, the hearing protection definitely have a lot less noise ex the noise exposure hearing loss than those that aren't. Um, in the audiological setting, you know, it's kind of a 50-50 because 
there's just different reasons people come into the office versus you know they come into the industry truck. Um, so hearing protection is is definitely if you're wearing the right hearing protection, you know, definitely do your research because there are some types of hearing protection that aren't going to serve. Uh, that right. Thank you.